Okay, good afternoon. My name is Samantha Marshall, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at the University of Toledo Alumni Association. Welcome to all of our attendees and thank you for joining us for what will be a lively conversation with U Toledo alumnus, Dr. Burr Zimmerman. Today's content is provided by a few of our alumni affiliate groups, the Jessup Scott Honors College, the College of Engineering, and the John and Lillian Neff College of Business and Innovation. We also want to thank the U Toledo Incubation for working with us on this event. As our alumni and guests, students continue to join us, I wanted to share a little, uh, a few housekeeping notes for everyone. Please note that currently all of our attendees are on mute and your cameras are turned off. Please use the chat function um, as we continue today's conversation to ask any questions that you may have. We are going to be monitoring that chat feature throughout the event. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, 2015 graduate Jordan Valdivez. Jordan. Hi, everybody. Uh, and uh, Samantha, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks to all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Jessup Scott Honors College, Dean Heidi Apple, who is uh, going to tell you about what a privilege it is to have our guest speaker today, Burr Zimmerman. So uh, Heidi, take it away. Thanks, Jordan, and welcome everyone. We've got alumni, students, and friends joining us today. And I'm especially pleased to have Burr Zimmerman with us today as an honors alum. Burr graduated from the University College of Engineering in 1998 with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. And then he went on to receive his PhD in chemical engineering from that place down the road, the Ohio State University. Burr is co-founder and principal at Urban Venture Group, a firm focused on advancing science and commercializing emerging technology. So we're really pleased to have him here to join our discussion of intrapreneurship. Thank you, Heidi. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about the topic today, intrapreneurship. I, I think entrepreneurship is a term that a lot of people have heard about. And, you know, entrepreneurship is, is starting a new venture, starting a new business. And a lot of people look at that and they say, wow, that's risky. I don't know if I could do that. But there are some principles of entrepreneurship that can be applied within an employment uh, environment, and we call that intrapreneurship. And I think that term is not as well known, but I think it's a really exciting concept, and it can it can make your your work life more uh, edifying, more enriching, and it can make you more successful in your work life. Um, so I'm really excited to present today. Um, I do want to give a little bit of background about myself because I've got a few entre and intrapreneurship stories uh, that I can share that maybe can spur uh, some questions and discussions. So um, as Heidi mentioned, I did my undergrad at University of Toledo, go Rockets. Um, and as I was a student, I was an entrepreneur. Um, this was the, the mid nineties and this was when the, the World Wide Web was a brand new thing. Uh, and so I started making web pages for different departments around the university and actually started a business while I was a student. Uh, and it was fantastic. I, I made a lot more money than I would have working at Wendy's. I bought a, a new Saturn car, which those of you who are my age will laugh because no one ever thought Saturns were cool, but I did. Um, and um, but then when I graduated, I, I stopped. I just I just stopped. I took a job with a big pharma company and I was following the path that I was supposed to follow. But I still had that entrepreneurial um spark in me. And so I, I want to tell you a tale, uh, two stories of entrepreneurship, one successful and one unsuccessful in, in my life. So my first job uh, out of undergrad was with a big pharma company in Dallas, Texas. And the short version is I was an interface between people who are developing biomolecular assays and people who are writing software for machines to run those assays. And um, I was very entrepreneurial. I made a, a new website to serve updates and manuals and track revisions and everybody loved it. And, and I think because I was working with software people that idea was very intuitive. And so um, I got promoted, I got recognized, I got sent up to headquarters, which was in Chicago and I tried to do the same things and I fell flat on my face. So my job in Chicago was to gather chemical process data and develop reports and identify errors and risks for management. 
Um, and this was a full-time job gathering all that data, walking from building to building, getting data. You know, this was kind of before everything was automated. Um, but I automated it and I turned my 40 hour a week job into a four hour a week job. And I made an entire department of eight job be able to be done by one person. And you might think, wow, that's incredible. They should be really happy about that. And they weren't, they were really upset about it. They didn't wanna lose their people. And the older engineers didn't want things automated. And since my job only took four hours a week, I had a lot of time to get in trouble, which I did. I got really good at fantasy football and I took up golf. Uh, and I made some other process changes that led to some big savings for the company. And so I got uh, the highest technical award that the company could give and got demoted in the same month. And this, I think, is a really interesting story of the pitfalls of entrepreneurship. So um, to me, the, the big question is who really is your customer? Um, and understanding who it is, you know, an entrepreneur, you know, if you run a food truck, uh, you know who your customer is. It's the person who comes up to your food truck and orders a taco, right? Um, but if you're running a, a medical device company, is your customer a patient? Is it the doctor? Is it the hospital? Is it the insurance company? Is it the FDA who has to approve your medical device? It's very complicated to know who your customer is. And in intrapreneurship, when you're in a job, it's sometimes very hard to know who you really need to serve. Who really is your customer? Is it your boss? Uh, is it the customer to the company? So uh, today I'm really excited to talk about some of these questions about applying entrepreneurial skills within an employment environment, so-called intrapreneurship. And um, I, again, really pleased to be here. And I hope this introduction gives you uh, some uh, potential questions or discussion topics today. So Jordan, back to you. Yeah, Burr, what a great just kind of intro there looking at kind of the whole continuum of your career and just a real quick snapshot. Love that. Um, and again, just for anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, if you thought of a question you want to ask Burr, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, we'll be we'll be looking at that and we'll, we'll get to those chat questions at uh, some point in uh, today's session. But um, kind of zooming out and uh, looking back at kind of like your initial interaction um, as, you know, 17 year old Burr Zimmerman, uh, 17, 18 year old coming into um, uh, a university, what, I, what brought you to the university? You're obviously a smart guy. Um, you probably had uh, different options. What, what, what did that look like for you? Uh, just at the beginning, just real, real briefly. Yeah, for sure. So what made me fall in love with UT was the personal attention. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I had a, a pretty good high school academic record and, and I got accepted into some, you know, quote unquote top schools. And I chose Toledo because of the personal attention. Uh, I am an engineer and, and Toledo obviously has an excellent engineering program, but especially as an undergrad at some of the bigger schools, you get forgotten as an undergrad. Uh, and I could see very clearly at Toledo, I was gonna get personal attention. And, and for me and my personality, I didn't, I didn't wanna be lost in the crowd. I wanted to have some special opportunities. So that was what really drew me to UT. And I, and I think it absolutely uh, fulfilled on that promise. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, so now, while you were here, um, so like, what about the Honors College program? Um, what, what, what was your experience in that? And, and how do you see, in hindsight, that that uh, prepared you for all the different things you've done and what you're currently doing? Yeah, so the Honors College was really influential because I came to school thinking I was going to be an engineer. I was going to get deep into, the, I was a chemical engineer, so get, get deep into the chemistry and the biology. We Back then, we didn't have a bioengineering department yet. They were under chemical engineering, so I thought I was going to be, you know, a scientist and an engineer. Um, the Honors College gave me a chance to interact with super, super smart people in completely different fields. I got to meet world-class researchers, guests that came in, world-class speakers. I, I spent an hour with Dr. Cornell West, just sitting next to him and chatting. It was incredible. Um, and so- And, and who, who is Dr. Cornell West, just so people don't, that, that don't know? Yeah, for sure. So Dr. Cornell West is a, a, a sociologist, I believe, by training, Harvard uh, a social justice speaker, uh, longtime leader in, in, in thought on uh, racial equality and other issues like that. And you know, me coming from uh, the background I came from, that was a very eye-opening conversation. It, it, you know, just that's one example that stands out. There were many more, but what the Honors College gave me was the opportunity to interact with people that were 
you know, different from me and super smart and really opened my eyes to perspectives I hadn't had before. Um, and I think it made a big difference. And in my career today, I often tell people I'm more like an oil slick than an oil well. So an oil well is very deep and, and but very narrow. And, and my professional job is really to be very broad. I don't go as deep as, as anyone really, um, but I cover a lot of things. And I think the honors experience I had, you know, taught me how important and how valuable that might be. Yeah, very interesting. Um, especially, you know, we all have specializations that things that we like, things that we're really good at. And I think that, you know, what you're saying is that the college experience really kind of broadened your horizons, broadened your 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 mind and kind of had an influence on you to see the world that it's a lot bigger than 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 uh, engineering. Although engineering is so incredibly important, having good engineers, having these skills that are developed to develop all this different technology that you know, quite honestly, is is invisible to so many of us. I mean, chemical engineering. How often does an average person think about chemical engineers? Yet, you know, we're we're surrounded by the wonders of chemical engineering and all types of engineering, but it's just it's just invisible to us. Um, and and it it it's a beautiful thing when you have good technology like that. And uh, so so yeah, um, so that's really really cool to see that that effect and that it kind of launched you into your your what you talked about, like the different career points that you've had, you know, and you kind of came up against some points of innovation where you created innovation. And it sounds like you decided that you were going to create your own thing where all you, all you focus on is innovation. So tell us about Urban Venture Group. For sure. So I, so uh, the, the continuation of the story is I had this job in Chicago, I got an award and I got demoted in the same sentence. And it became clear that this place wasn't my forever home. And so I decided to go back to graduate school. And honestly, I thought I was gonna just go be a professor. And be, by the way, academic careers are very entrepreneurial. You have to chase your own funding, you have to manage your education and research programs. And um, there's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity there. Uh, but when I was in grad school, I fell in with a really bad crowd. They were called MBA students. And I started <laughs> at the, the business opportunities associated with science and technology. Um, when I was a student at UT, I gave campus tours and, and people would often say to me, you're an engineer, you don't seem like an engineer. And I think that was uh, talking about the fact that that I just always had interest beyond just the engineering and I really liked to communicate about engineering. So I, in grad school, I, uh, I became friends with a, a professor and an entrepreneur in the community. And they said, hey, Burr, don't, don't take a job, start this innovation consulting firm with us. Um, and so I, I did that. And so uh, good news, bad news, the professor turns out really liked being a professor. So he left the firm pretty early. Um, and then my other partner, unfortunately, we lost him to MS about two years ago. So, um, so yeah, so I went from being a, a three partner firm to a two partner firm to me being the, the lead partner. Um, and there's been I'm happy to talk more about how the business changed over that time. Um, but what I learned was, is there is a transition from technology development to where you have to communicate it to the outside world. And, and if, I, if I would say there's one underlying principle about my business, it's about being outward facing, external focus. A, a term that I use in a, in a negative way is myopic. We don't want to be myopic. We don't want to be so focused on our own thing, on what's in front of us. We want to be outwardly focused. And I think that's really the core principle of entra and intrapreneurship, which is understanding what who your customer is and what they want and being focused on what they need. Uh, one thing they don't teach in engineering school I, that I've seen at least is this concept of hospitality. Um, in engineering and science, they teach you there's a right answer and the data will tell you what the right answer. Um, in consulting especially, but I think in, co in commercialization, entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship, it's not just about the data, it's about the relationships with those people around you and understanding what their priorities are, what their, what their values are and what their needs are. And, and hospitality is really about understanding them so deeply that your focus is to provide and meet for their needs, even if they don't, uh, even if they're not able to articulate what they are, you understand them well enough that you can almost predict what they might need and have it ready for when they need it. So um, 
I think I would say Urban Venture Group is focused on that difficult transition. And it's a difficult transition because the people that develop technology often don't, they haven't been taught the skills that it takes to transition into a market setting. Interesting, interesting. And I would, I would say, I, you know, for, for the time I've been involved in, uh, in venture development and incubation and business, that term hospitality, I have not heard it used in that context. And I think that's really interesting. Um, Cause personally I come from a, like, I mean, I, I started working when I was 15. I've always had a job. I've always wanted to, you know, work and, and uh, make money for myself, that type of thing. And um, I, I worked a lot in, in the food industry. Like, you know, I mean, you're, you're young, can you grow you whatever job you can, right? But um, that, that really speaks to kind of the service aspect. And um, as a person that is also um, has an engineering degree um, in information technology, I also have a, it, part of that was in business as well. Um, that, you know, being, being able to focus really specifically on a technical thing you off, that often diverges from that kind of uh, human part of hospitality, of seeing the nuances of the customer, right? It's you, you, you're, more, you're more likely to, you know, want to just create a thing according to a spec sheet. But there, it seems like there's, there's, a, there's kind of a combination of all those skills and that seems to be like a magic recipe. Is is that kind of kind of uh, your niche in as far as your the urban event, urban venture group? It, do you do you find that the combination of those technical and and uh, more I guess human things is is where you guys are finding success? Yeah, I think that's part of it. So the business, uh, you asked this question before, and I kind of didn't answer it very well. So the business is about helping organizations raise capital to support innovation. So uh, you can go to venture capitalists or private equity or angel investors, and that money is expensive. You can go to banks, and by expensive, I mean, you have to pay a, a high return on investment to those mm -hmm. investors. You can go to a bank and that money is less expensive. The interest rates at banks are typically lower than the return that investors expect, but it's hard to get bank loans, especially if you're a startup. And the, the government, the United States government has recognized that there are some national needs that, that the commercial sector can't fulfill on its own. And the really obvious example is, is with COVID, a very recent example. And the US government said, how can we accelerate and catalyze therapeutics and treatments and, and diagnostics that will help us respond to the COVID crisis. Um, but before that, there's lots of examples. You know, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, they can't go to the store and buy a rocket. They have to, they have to put money out on the street to get companies to develop new technologies. And so- no rocket stores, geez. Right, right. We have the rocket store, but they only sell really cool clothing. There's no, I mean, maybe, do they have bottle rockets? I don't know, but- no, um, Let's, we'll, have to, we'll have to do some customer discovery on, on the, uh, the market for rockets. We'll see. So the business is helping companies access this additional third leg of capital supported by the Department of Defense, supported by the Department of Health and Human Services, supported by the Department of Energy. So folks that are trying to access different kinds of capital that they come to us. And because every technology is different and because every agency is different, we're, I think our, our, our customization and tailored approach is well received by our customers. Yeah, I really like that. And you're, it, it really leads us really smoothly into the next question we have here, which is kind of, I mean, I think you, the, the question is, is, you know, how would you define intra and entrepreneurship? But it, it sounds like you, you've really been answering that question this whole time, you know, which is like, you're, you, you're constantly looking for a solution to something, right? Whether that solution is technical, whether you, you're looking at, you know, a relational um, component of a partnership, of a sale, of a problem. Um, but I guess to really zoom in on all that information you've been sharing, how would you define entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I, I like the introduction that you said there, which is identifying potential problems and trying to find ways to solve them. I think in an entrepreneurship setting, 
it's real direct whether the marketplace agrees that you've solved the right problem because you go out of business if you haven't. Right. Intrapreneurship is different. I think the challenge in intrapreneurship is tougher because it's very difficult to validate which problems are the right problems to solve. I, in my experience, saw how inefficient my job was, and I thought the problem to solve was to make it more efficient, automate it, reduce errors, and allow us to do process improvement. Um, management didn't agree with me. And if I had been a better intrapreneur, I would have spent more time validating my creative ideas you know, that I was excited about, um, validating them that that was, in fact, what management wanted. Um, you know, just very candidly, I was a young engineer and I, I wasn't doing the right thing, even though I thought I was, even though I was trying to do the right thing. Um, so I think, I think for me, the challenge and the difference with entrepreneurship is that I think it's a little harder uh, to know and to validate what the real needs are and, and what the right way to solve them is. With, with entrepreneurship, customers tell you. When you work in a company, management may not give you visibility into all the factors that you need to know to make those decisions. So entrepreneurship is applying entrepreneurial principles within an employment setting and the additional extra challenge of, of making, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's easy because you're, um, you can get that information. Sometimes it's not. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and I think, you know, we've all been, uh, you know, young and ambitious, and I'm sure there's plenty of young and ambitious uh, engineers, business students, all the uh, people that have gone through that phase. And I think one of the things that really is really helpful in that stage is having mentors or at least people that can speak to that situation, like what you're talking about. You know, um, you know anybody listening that's in. I'm sure there's there's plenty of people listening right now that are in the same place you were. Those, minute, those many years ago and maybe frustrated because it's hard to make progress. But I think it's really more of a, uh, it's an exercise in, in thinking, in design thinking, you know, in problem solving, that how do we get through this? Like, I think it's just this problem, this technical problem, but a technical problem always has layers of people because the complexities are all, it seems like things are always more complex than we think they are, right? We always just wanna fix this thing, but then by fixing this thing, you kind of affect these other things. And it's, uh, it's a learning process that we all go through and uh, it's, it makes us better problem solvers, right? It makes us better, better people, better, better workers, better members of this community. Well, so we've kind of cast a little bit of a challenge here. And I also wanna cast an opportunity and some sunshine on the subject too. So first of all, um, I enjoy communicating and, and engaging with other people. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be a consultant if I didn't. Um, if you want, if you have that entrepreneurial interest, if you want to be an entrepreneur within the organization that you're in, I would encourage you to widen or broaden your definition of problem solving to include communication and include engaging. And so some of the things that I did uh, in when I was employed by a really big company was I would set up meetings with folks in different areas half an hour just to talk to them find out what what things were of interest to them what things were the challenges what were you know and and that was enormously valuable so that's kind of like market research but on an entrepreneurial level so one thing I would suggest is reach out to people and ask them if they're willing to talk with you ask lots of questions and then definitely ask lots of questions within your part of the organization, within your department or within your division. What are the major goals? What are the major challenges? And how can I do my job in a way that is aligned with your goals? You know, managers are busy, right? They may not, um, they may not have the bandwidth or they may not think of telling you those things. They may think you know them already. And I would encourage you to ask. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of assuming or guessing. And I think as an entrepreneur, I tell the people that I coach all the time, don't guess, validate, ask. And so, uh, you know, what I think, and, and so, all right, so what I'm trying to paint the picture of is entrepreneurship has some established skills that you can employ uh, that are really proven to be successful and the rewards are great. First of all, you'll get uh, just, for me at least, great satisfaction from implementing a program that worked, just internal satisfaction of doing something. So I'm, um, 
one of the processes that I was in charge of had a particular unit operation. Um, and I changed the way the unit operation operated and we saved a million dollars a year. And uh, we didn't have to refile with the FDA. And I paid for my salary many times over. And I was just so proud that I was able to see this very simple change, but had a big difference. And so that's very satisfying. Um, and then the other side of it is if you are ambitious, Jordan used the word ambitious, if you have an interest in raising into management or raising to higher levels of management, having that perspective and experience is so critical. So I think entrepreneurship, even though it's not always easy, pays huge dividends in terms of professional advancement. And I think you know, it's not a lot different than doing your job well already. There's just a couple additions that if you can make a part of your habits can make a huge difference in your professional success. Awesome. Um, we do have a, a question in the chat that we'll get to here in a minute from our good friend, Doug Rammel, who's a fellow alumni. Um, but we're going to go into our student panel here that has some awesome questions. Um, so what, how we're going to do this is um, we're going to start with Katie. And Katie, just introduce yourself by uh, state your name and your major and uh, your year and uh, we'll just go from there so um, uh, so Katie go ahead and uh, ask the question for Burr. Sounds good thanks Jordan um, my name is Katie Christ I'm currently a junior in the College of Business I'm majoring in finance and information systems and we did get a few questions from audience members prior to this so I'll kick it off with the first one. Uh, Burr, um, how do you navigate being an entrepreneur and having entrepreneurship qualities at an employer who does not condone such skills? I think you kind of touched on this earlier with your demotion. So if you kind of want to expand on that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's important. To, so at UVG, we talk about the innovation as, as core to our values. And if you're going to take risks and try things new, if you're going to innovate, that means you're going to make mistakes. And in my opinion, there's no such thing as increasing risk without increasing mistakes. And so what we talk about is making mistakes is okay, as long as they're the right kinds of mistakes. Um, and so that's one example of a way that I try to encourage a culture of innovation within Urban Venture Group. And I talk about that with, with my customers, my clients, uh, about how do you build a culture of innovation. Um, you know, we, this question, uh, you know, we talked about this during our, our prep calls for this session, and, and I was a little worried about answering this, and I'm going to just answer it in a genuine way. Um, the truth is, innovators aren't always a fit in every organization. And let me give you an example, um, Davis-Bessey nuclear power plant. Um, do you want an innovator, a risk taker, to be running a nuclear power plant? M maybe not. Um, and so, there, you know, the, the question is, um, where do you find a fit for the, the degree and type of innovation or in a, uh, being an innovator that you want to be? Um, if, you know, candidly, not every job is a fit. I left my job because they really didn't want the kind of innovator that I was. And I don't blame them for that. You know, they were, a, a, you know, a big pharma company that was trying to turn the crank and they didn't want someone bringing in new cranks to turn. So, um but what I would say is, you know, depending on your, your level within the organization, if, if you're uh, a, a, an individual contributor, you know, having that conversation with your manager, um, I think is a great place to start and see how they react. I, I'm a huge fan of understanding where you and your manager stand and if they're a supporter of what you want and if they live it, if they walk the walk, not just talk the talk, then there's, a, then there's potential to grow and, and um, expand that innovation opportunity for you. But if your company um, really doesn't engage in that and they make it clear that innovation isn't something they want from you, um, you just have to recognize that maybe that's not the place to stay. You know, uh, McDonald's doesn't want a person at the cashier to innovate how to take money from customers. They want you to follow the procedure. So um, I think another, uh, this is, this happens in engineering a lot. Engineers think that innovation is always good, that innovation by definition is good. Um, and the truth is it's not. Um, in some places, innovation is not worth the risk. And so I think having that conversation with your manager, with your company will help you decide if it's a fit there or not. I, I would say that unless you're at a very senior level, 
changing your company's culture uh, toward innovation is going to be a tough challenge. And, and I think you should take that under serious consideration because you may not be able to, to, to make that change as quickly as you'd like. Did I dance around that well enough, Jordan? I think that was that was really good. You know, I think that it makes a lot of sense because it is a risky business implementing anything new. And I mean, there's entrepreneurship is there's there's more people that fail at it than win, to be honest. So um, you don't fail. So I'm, I'm sorry to jump in. I have made lots of mistakes, but I don't think I failed. And I, you know, did I fail um, when I got demoted? I don't think so, because it pushed me on a path that that really crystallized in my mind that I needed to make a change. And I love what I do. I, I just can't emphasize this enough. I'm energetic and excited. I love who I work with as customers. I love who I work with within my company. Um, I, I, I love what I do. I, I, I love it. And if, if I hadn't quote unquote failed, I, I would have stayed there and, and who knows what, have, what would have happened. But I don't, I don't view it as failure. I, I view it as learning and, and pivoting. And, you know, I'm, it, you know, there's, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of satisficers or, uh, or optimizers and it's satisficer, not satisfier. But the concept is, are you trying to do just enough to be good enough? Or are you always trying to optimize and always trying to make something better? And, and you're not one thing or the other in all aspects, but I'm very strongly on the optimizer side. Whatever it is I'm doing, I'm trying to do it better. And I had to, I had to take stock of my personality and, and you know, have some soul searching to, to find a thing that would be a great fit for me. And, and I, didn't, you know, I didn't know when I took my first job. I didn't know myself and I didn't know how the business world worked uh, I'm not sure I do now, but I certainly didn't then. Um, but, you know, there's a soul searching that I don't like failure, but I do like learning. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think uh, all great points, great points. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question here from Gabby. Uh, Gabby, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, pitch your question to Bert. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Jordan. So my name is Gabriella Cario, and I'm a senior studying bioengineering. And as Katie mentioned, we had some questions that were submitted beforehand. So our next one is, we've talked about how to use your skills of an entrepreneur and entrepreneur in situations within the workplace. You touched on this with your stories. Um, these are often positioned in the middle or the bottom of an organizational chart. So now that you're president and founder of a company, how does your use of these skills change? Well, um... The truth is I use them every day. It is core to my job because I'm really the one who sells. Um, so when, you know, folks reach out to me, new customers reach out to me, I'm the one taking that call. And, and so there's a, there's a, a sales process that we follow. It's called discovery based selling. And, and what that means is you might think of a used car salesman who's just trying to force you to buy a car and pressure you and use little you know, psychological tricks. And, and we're the opposite of that. I, my sole job is, is discovery. It's to understand what that prospective customer's needs are, try to figure out if we can help them or not. Uh, maybe the best way for me to help them is to refer to them to someone else who can help them better. Um, but the, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skill set that I used all along and is most central is that, again, that external validation, asking questions, communicating, always validating assumptions, don't guess, ask. Um, and I think that's useful top and bottom, but I use that every day in selling. And, and I think as an entrepreneur, asking good questions and really listening to the answers is, you know, the, the truth is a lot of engineers, I'm, you know, and, and I don't mean to make this at all about engineering, but I'm an engineer. Um, a lot of engineers find picking up the phone or, you know, communicating hard. It's not intuitive. It's not um, comfortable. And, um, and so that's a challenge. Like, how do I make, I used to hate selling. I guess I, I was intimidated. I was nervous. And when I, when I learned that my job wasn't to close the sale so much as learn what the customer needed and then present them a solution that would resonate with them, it got a lot easier. It wasn't high pressure anymore. It was just learning, which I love doing anyway. So I reframed the challenge and that's what helped me get over that hump. I didn't answer your question. I answered lots of other things. Sorry about that. Um, any, any feedback from that, Gabriella? Anything 
I think that was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate the answer to your question. I think you answered it pretty well. So thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Lot, lots to lots to pick out from that. Um, so we're going to move on to Clay. Clay, go ahead and give an uh, introduction and then uh, ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Um, I'm Clay Lenhart. I'm a fourth year bioengineering student. Um, the question I have is how do how can I become the best entrepreneur within my workplace? So I think um, I think what it means to be the best entrepreneur is operationally defined. It's situational. It's contextual. There's no one answer to it. But I want to go back to. Um, I would say definitely make sure you understand the goals of the organization that you're in. And organization could mean department, division, the whole company, whatever. Um, understand who your customers are. Who do you need to make happy? When you get your year-end review and your raise, hopefully, who are they going to ask? Was, was Clay a great engineer or was he a, a good engineer? So understand who your customer is. And then also try to gain that bigger perspective. Try to reach out to other different organizations to learn what they're about, because that will open up new opportunities for you. If nothing else, when you have a problem to solve in your job, you'll have a Rolodex. Well, there's a data term. You'll have a contacts list of people um, that you can call and reach out to and you have a relationship with, and that'll allow you to solve problems faster. And, and Jordan, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a little rabbit hole here. Um, my customers come from so many different technical areas. I'm not an expert in them. And so one of the, another key skill set that we have at UVG is this network of subject experts that we reach out to when we need to. Um, and so that network that I maintain is something that you can do as an entrepreneur as well. Um, and I'll use pharmace pharmaceutical industry as an example, since that's where I'm from. But if I need some regulatory experience, if I need some safety experience, if I need some communications experience, I, you know, I know who to reach out to. If, if you're in a, an automotive company and you need plastics experience or you need safety experience or you need whatever, you know, reach out to people and have that network available. People are going to marvel like, oh, how did you get that done so fast? Well, because I laid the groundwork already. Yeah, I mean, I'm working at a pharmaceutical manufacturing company right now. So I get that. I mean, knowing all the jargon and regulations is half the battle. There's a lot of alphabet soup everywhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> by the way, you know, since we're talking about that, there's another skill set that I think engineers and I think um, senior management, whether you're an engineer or not, um, they think they have to be the smartest person in the room because they're the boss or I'm the technical person. And there's, it's really powerful to say, I don't know, or what do you think, or I'm going to go find that out. Um, use that that's I, yeah I see Jordan thumbs upping so um, I think that's something that could be reinforced for everyone the power of I don't know and what do you think is is really great yeah just a second that like I mean because I think when you get a culture of everybody having to have an answer for everything right a lot of times those answers are not accurate you know um, anybody can can you know come up with a reasonable explanation for something but having actual reality driven solutions is always the best way but that's a that's enough for me so <laughs> we're going to move on to the next uh next question uh so that is back to katie thank you jordan um next question is going to be for those alumni in attendance who work in leadership positions or supervisors within their companies how do you foster a spirit of entrepreneurship within your employees, regardless of their role? Yeah, I, I love this question. That's something I work on every day. So um, I talked earlier about mistakes being okay, as long as they're the right kinds of mistakes. And I think maybe my, my number one answer would be to recognize that if you're gonna be innovative, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, if you're gonna experiment, not every one of those experiments is gonna pan out and you need to reward I think, I think I want to reward people for making the right kinds of efforts, even if they don't pan out. Um, mistakes are okay. 
um, you know, uh, if, if you're driving and you make a wrong turn and you have to turn around, that's a mistake that's okay. If you, you know, drive 50 miles an hour into a tree, that's a mistake that's not okay. So when we're innovating, we have to understand what mistakes are, are okay, survivable, tolerable, and what mistakes aren't, and make sure that we, we, we keep our innovation within the bounds of, of what is likely to be uh, a net benefit versus a, a net negative. But I, I really try not to punish mistakes that are related to effort and engagement and, and, and innovation. Now, if mistakes are due to sloppiness or shortcuts, that's different, but I think, um, so, so, all right, so number one, how do you encourage innovation? Number one is to tolerate mistakes. I think number two is to communicate the vision of the organization so that your folks that work for you understand where they should be innovating. So uh, in my company, uh, we talk about values all the time. We talk, our, some of our values are always deliver value to the customer, uh, always behave ethically, always protect our customers' confidential information uh, because you know these things might lead to patents, they might lead to huge business opportunities. We've been working on COVID trials where um, you know the results of the COVID trial literally mean the difference between life and death. Um, and so confidentiality is, is a core value for our business. And as long as the people that work for me know what our values are, they know where to innovate and where not to. Um, I would not encourage them to innovate with posting um, client information on Twitter. That would not be a good innovation. Um, but they would never do that because they know our values. And so when they come to me with ideas, they're usually pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, do that. That sounds awesome. And then we measure later. So that maybe the third piece would be, once you try an experiment, measure it. So there's this concept of plan, do, study, act, where you, you make a plan, you try it out, you study what happen from it and then you make take an action based on it the action might be to stop it might be to do something that's slightly modified or it might be to expand what you did but you always need to assess the innovation and and i think that's actually really a, a motivational tool because people know that you're looking thoughtfully at what they've attempted and what they've tried and you're you're sort of rationally acting on it whether it's positive or negative and by the way rewarding them for making the attempt even if it doesn't pan out yeah, I really like that. Um, having clearly defined standards and values for people to operate according to, that's that's just good leadership and uh, obviously opens the doors for uh, people to have significant and meaningful innovation. Love it. Um, any Anything to add to that one, uh, Katie? Or uh, good to go? Good to All go. Right. Thanks. All right. We're going to move on to Gabby's question. Uh, Gabby, take it away. Thank you, Jordan. So this one's a little longer one, so bear with me. Um, as a soon-to-be graduate of the University of Toledo, when it comes to climbing the corporate ladder, it seems like everyone has an opinion and often they're conflicting. I've been told that the days of starting and finishing at the same company are over, that the best way up is out. At the same time, I've also been told that I shouldn't leave my company because this will look bad and make me seem disloyal to my current and future employers. Do you agree with this? advice or disagree? And how much is loyalty valued in the workplace compared to other employee characteristics? Yeah, so um, I'm going to answer the first question briefly and incompletely because I want to get to the loyalty question. So I, I think um, when you're transitioning outside of a company, the messaging and why you did it is really important. And, and if you have good reasons to do it, you know, hey, I wanted to expand my skill set into a new area that my current employer didn't do. Um, I wanted to move to a different geographical area, although in COVID, we're learning that you can work from anywhere. Um, UVG is a virtual company. My team members are in California, Denver, Ohio. You know, we don't have, you can't come to world headquarters of UVG, it doesn't exist. Um, so we're a virtual company and, and in 2009, that was weird, but in, in 2021, everyone's like, oh yeah, that kind of works. So, um, so the messaging of why you make transitions, I think is really key. I think you can be perceived as capricious if you don't have a good reason for leaving. Uh, if you burn bridges, that's a, that's a red flag that you might be leaving for not the best reasons. Um, but there are plenty of people that stay in the same company for a very long time. I've worked with some terrific companies as clients where people have been there. The new guy has been there for 15 years. And 
um, you know, it just depends on the situation. So, um, and so that brings me to the concept of loyalty. Um, my view on loyalty is I want to help my people find happiness and find success. And if that means helping them find a new job, I do that. I will, I will talk with, you know, someone they're interviewing with, tell them what they're great at and help them because I, you know, I, I have a long view on this. Um, you know, it, loyalty is not, you know, taking punishment at any expense. That's not, you know, I think loyalty is two ways. I show loyalty to my people by treating them as well as I can, by listening to them, by trying to put them in positions where they can be successful, by listening to the things that they enjoy doing and want to do more of and giving them more opportunities in that area. We talk about that all the time. What, what will make you love your job? Let's do more of that. What do you not like about your job? Let's find a way for you to do less of that. Let's find someone else who does love it. You know, picking up the phone is a great example. More introverted people, and I don't love that term, but more introverted people might find it hard to pick up the phone. That might be very draining for them. Um, extroverted people might hate, you know, building this beautiful giant spreadsheet. So let's let's have people do the things that they like doing and are good at doing and and challenge them the right amount, not not too much, not too little. And so that's how I show loyalty to the people that work for me. And if I can't give them what they want, then I want to help them get to where they want to be because, you know, happy happy colleagues are productive and, and successful colleagues. I had, uh, so um, I had a friend uh, who I hired into my company. He unfortunately lost his job. He was laid off and needed help. Um, and so I hired him in as just a provisional thing. He turned out to be a wonderful uh, worker. He, he was dedicated. He was precise. He was caring. I loved him. He was great. And one day out of the blue, he said, I'm leaving. And I said, what? And he said, I don't like virtual offices. I like having the water cooler. I like driving a half an hour, which this blew my mind. I hated commuting. He loved the commute. He got to listen to his podcast. He got to unwind. And, and when he went home, work was done and he was with his family and there was a clear divide. And if you're working virtually, as, as people now know with the pandemic, everyone knows this, when you work virtually, it's very hard to set boundaries. Um, and so, you know, he left the company for all legitimate good reasons. Um, and, and so then my job was to help him be successful in his next step. I didn't consider that disloyal. Uh, you know, I thought he was great and I wanted to help him. So that's how I show loyalty. And I think um, as long as when you work for me, as long as you're, you know, making an effort, doing your best, you know, being a good coworker and being productive, that's, that's all the loyalty I think I can expect. Um, now I have really high standards. I'm gonna push you to be better but that's different than loyalty. Very well said, very well said. I, I like your definition of loyalty. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very healthy perspective and uh, good, good, good view there, really good view. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next question from Clay. Clay, go ahead and uh, pitch your question. Yeah, if you could go back in time and give advice to your younger self, Burr Zimmerman, the chemical engineering student, what would it be? Um, I think it's, it's really about people and relationships. Um, I'm a person who conflict doesn't bother me. Like I like debating things like, um, so I'm, I'm, some people are conflict averse. I am as an innovator. I like that tension, that creative tension. Um, and I think, um, understanding that for many folks, creative tension is just tension. And I think over the last 20 years, I've become, more aware of every personality being different and trying to, um, you know, trying to trying to get to know people on a on a personality and style level rather than just sort of running my own playbook. I, I've got a playbook that I'm comfortable with, but over the years I've learned lots of other playbooks. I don't mean to turn this into sports, but as you can see, I've got I've got the glass bowl behind me. Um, you know, football teams put together different game plans for different opponents and. Um, and I guess opponents isn't really the right example here, but the point is they, for different situations, they have different plans. And I think the one piece of advice that I would give 17 year old me or even 25 year old me would be to take stock of the situation, especially take stock of the personalities and the, the non-technical factors that are involved and try to build a solution that takes into account all of those parameters, not just the ones that you're familiar with. I, I, I love calculus. I could calculate, you know, solutions readily. Um, calculus wasn't the right tool all the time. 
So make sure you're, you're using the right tool for the right situation. Right tool for the right situation. Gosh, that can be said for so many things. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, let me let me take the other flip side of that. I know you're trying to move on to more questions. No, yeah, no, we're good. But you know, we talk about you know certain societal topics where people are um, not believing things or believing things. Some people are going to believe something that you know, let's say, isn't supported by science. Some people are going to not believe something that's supported by science. Science isn't always the right tool for the job, uh, and I think you know, in business, you have to recognize that the data aren't necessarily the right tool to convince someone to do business with you, even though you might feel the data are incontrovertible. Um, and so in society, I think a lot of us have an intuitive understanding that, that you know, science isn't, it might be a great tool for a lot of things, but it isn't the only tool. And, and you, if your goal is to be successful in business, you have to recognize that, that you need more tools than that. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, you got to make sure that it speaks to your audience, right? Like you, you can, you can arrange data in many different ways that that's true, but if you can arrange it in a way that communicates what you want to that person, then that's the win. But too often we get in this, in, in this space of, I'm just going to say it how it is, you know, and it doesn't always speak to the people, to your audience. Uh, you know, something that I, that I, know to be true, but it isn't always easy to implement is the saying, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Mm. And in business, I've sought to connect with my customers and let them know that I'm their ally. I'm there to help them be successful. And I'm listening to what that means. I'm not just turning the crank and running my playbook. Great advice. Great advice. All right, we got a couple more questions, and then we'll, I think we might have some time to answer some of the um, audience questions. But we're moving over to Gabby. Gabby's got another question for us. Yes. So thank you, Jordan and Burr. The next question is: What are some opportunities to increase entrepreneurship skills? So I, I think for many people, you've got you know workplaces are diverse now. Um, for many people, they have a skill set that they're deep in, and then they have adjacent skill sets that they're not as deep in. And I, I think going back to this concept of, of perspective and context in the business, I would seek to understand more aspects. Don't go deeper and narrower in your specific field, but go wider and broader into other adjacent fields or even far away fields. So um, let's say you're um, you know, a, a, in a law firm, uh, in a, you know, or let's say you're an internal counsel in a big company or, or in a legal department, go talk to the technical department, go talk with the marketing department. If you're a communications person, don't be afraid of understanding what manufacturing is. Don't be afraid of going on the floor. Uh, uh, the, the manufacturing for the factory. Um, and so I would say, you know, seek opportunities to be with and interact with folks that are in different areas. I think that really pays dividends down the road or immediately, who knows? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the, the core tenets of, of, I think, you know, a lot of tech entrepreneurship is get out of the lab, get out of your office, talk to real people, you know, and get out in, in the environment to talk to who you think is your customer or who you think is the person that needs the idea that you're, you're formulating, you know, kind of get out of your own head. I so. meet a lot of, so I, so I, I sit at the interface between business and technology and also between business and technology and government. So I, I deal with policy folks, I deal with scientists and I, I deal with folks that are, that are business communications, lawyers, et cetera. Um, I would say to the non-scientists and the non-engineers, don't be intimidated by the science and technology. Don't just think, oh, I can't do that. I see a lot of people who say, oh, I'm not a scientist. Don't tell me anything about that. And I would encourage you, you know, don't, don't be intimidated. You know, try, learn a little bit. And you might discover it's way more interesting than you thought and way more accessible than you thought. Uh, I do want to point out uh, there's several chat questions, um, and I haven't been reading them in detail, but I want to make sure I'm, I know I'm, I'm actually, we're going to have Katie kind of uh, field one of those. Um, uh, so go ahead, Katie, with, we're, we're going to, Katie will read that chat question and, and pitch it to you. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hop on that. So go ahead, Katie. 
Sounds good. We are going to start with a chat question. It's kind of a two-parter. So how do you figure out whether a company is serious about finding a better way or incentivizing in innovation? And how do you assess risk before an innovation and prepare for failure or success? So um, I'm going to answer the risk question first, and that goes back to the plan, do, study, act. You know, have a plan, know what you're testing, know why you're testing it, and talk to the stakeholders involved. Let the experts tell you what the risks are. Why You, you might discover that something could go wrong for an entirely different reason or an entirely different way than you realize. So I think that I talked about don't be myopic. I think myopia is is the risk here. You're too focused on your thing and you have a blind spot for something else that you don't see coming. Um, I tell my customers that a lot of times my job is to look around corners and find the landmines for them not to step on. That's a, a wonderful mixed metaphor. All of you who are writing majors are cringing. Um, so, but, you know, number one is is don't be myopic when you're looking at risks. Um, and then the company culture, I'm really glad you brought up company culture because I saw your question earlier about, you know, different companies say they're innovators and you mentioned um, GE and, and Procter and & Gamble and those are two companies that I've, I've worked with um, multiple times and both innovators, both very different culturally and I, I don't have time to go into detail about it, but culturally they're very different. The kinds of personalities who are successful in GE are very different than the personalities who are successful in P&G. And both companies have a, an innovation arc that they've followed over time. Their culture of innovation has changed over the years. GE in the 90s versus GE in 2021, hugely different. So I think what I would say is, it's not just if you innovate, it's how you innovate, it's, it, and the culture of the company influences what that means. And I would seek broad um, validation and input in terms of assessing risk, in terms of how you innovate. And obviously we could spend hours talking more about that. That's definitely true, that's definitely true. Um, gosh, we have a couple questions here. Um, let's see here, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, tease one of these out here. Um, let's see. Katie, did you did you read the first question there or, or was that the second question? I kind of addressed the first one. Yeah, yeah. It, it seemed like I'll I'll, uh, I'll read one of the more more recent ones here. Um, what activities can current stu students do to prepare for the human side of business and life? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have a little bit of a flippant answer and then I have a hard answer. Um, you know, I, I think um, having um, empathy, having a sense of understanding that different people come from different backgrounds and have different experiences is really important. And for me, that's a big motivator to get to know people so that I can serve them better and understand, you know, how I can do a better job for them. Um, uh, very candidly, and I'm, you know, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but that was a skill I had to learn. It didn't come naturally to me. I was, you know, hard charging, task focused, do your job. I was not all about, you know, people's situations. And I, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't my intuitive thing. So it's something I had to learn. And if you're in that situation, um, where it isn't your first, you know, intuitive thought, I think you can work on it. At least I have, you know, I'll, I'll let, I'll let other people decide if I've done a good job at it, but I know I've worked at it. And at least it's on my radar now. It's something that I consciously think about. So that would be one thing. Now on the other side of it, um, you know, some folks are too beholden to the emotion of the situation and they aren't, you know, they would uh, miss opportunities to complete tasks because they're overly concerned with what other people might think. And I, and so I do want to say that there's, uh, you know, I'm on one side of the balance point, but other people might be on the other side of the balance point and recognize that there's, you know, there's both sides that are suboptimal. And um, so it's, I, you know, I think as sword. a young, what? The double-edged sword, right? So I would say to a young person, you're, you're not going to be perfect calibrated right away, or if you are good for you, I'm, I'm, I'm envious, but for, I would say, be aware that that, you know, exists, that concept and, and thing exists and just be aware of it and practice it. You're going to make mistakes. That's okay. Nobody's perfect. But if you're aware of it and you're trying to maintain the balance, you'll be a step ahead. Love it. That's a, that's a great, I think that's a great way to end this conversation. Um, talking about the equilibrium of the the different disciplines needed 
Um, and that's definitely something that sounds like you gained from uh, all your experience. And uh, one of those experiences being uh, your, your time at UT in the Honors College and in the Engineering College. So um, thank you so much for uh, being here. Thanks students for, for all the questions. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Samantha and for some closing remarks. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, thank you so much, Burr, for all of this incredible information. This was certainly one of the virtual events that I had to keep reminding myself to pay attention logistically to the things I was supposed to do as I'm taking my notes and you know writing down all the things that you were saying. So the information was extremely helpful. And I know all of our alumni, friends, and students on the call certainly appreciated it. Thank you so much for taking your time. Jordan, thank you um, for moderating, today, moderating today's conversation and for all of our students for joining us. And Heidi, um, also thank you to you for joining us as well. Uh, thank you to everyone on the call. As a reminder, this was recorded and we will share this link with everyone once it's available via Zoom. And with that, um, I'm gonna close out today's event and, and thank everyone again for joining us. Uh, panelists, hang tight. We're gonna end the recording here in a moment, but just hang with us. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>